I did a giant Damascus study with a bunch of different steel combinations in the Damascus and almost every single test surprised me. For example, every Damascus maker knows that the key to the best edge retention Damascus is to have two high carbon steels in the Damascus. And instead, what if I told you that when we use soft nickel with the high carbon steel that it cut longer than all of the double high carbon mixes? I have studied many, many of the available knife steels, carbon steels, high alloy steels, stainless steels, high speed steels, you name it. I have tested most of them. What I have tested very little for knife steel nerds is Damascus steel, which uh, in some ways is surprising. Well, my father is named Devin Thomas. He's one of the greatest Damascus makers of all time. We were asked by the Blade Show to present on some subject, my father and I, and we chose to do performance at Damascus. It hasn't been studied that much, really. And so we did the biggest study ever performed on the performance of pattern welded Damascus. And that's what I'm gonna to present to you. Bill Moran famously reintroduced Damascus to the new custom knife industry in the early 1970s. And at that time, they were making all sorts of claims about the amazing performance of Damascus. Uh, one of the things they talked about was the so-called Damascus cutting effect. And they said that Damascus would outcut a plain steel because the soft layers would wear faster and the hard layers would stay sharp, leading to a serration or a saw-like cutting effect. And that that would lead to Damascus cutting longer. So these were things that these guys were saying, especially in the 1970s about Damascus. They also said that toughness would be better. They said it was similar to like plywood or a laminated bow, that the laminated materials would uh, be more resistant to fracture than a straight material. And they also said all kinds of weird things, you know, like Damascus took hundreds of hours to make or so much coal that it w didn't even make sense. And so all kinds of stuff about how Damascus was this incredible material, just like they talked about in the legends. So this is another thing that we wanted to test is were those old uh, legends true or are they just myths that we are happy to move on from. Now, one thing about the Damascus cutting effect is that they said it would happen by laminating low carbon and high carbon steels together. But carbon is a tiny element and it diffuses very rapidly, especially at the temperatures required for forge welding steel together. And they've done experiments and simulations on this, such as from Dr. Verhoeven and bladesmith Howard Clark and they determined that at normal layer counts and normal forge welding temperature, carbon ends up fully equalized in the steel. So you can start with low carbon steel and high carbon steel, but you end up with medium carbon steel at the end because carbon just diffuses so rapidly and it wants to be even throughout the steel. And so you end up with two hard steels. So sort of the fundamental basis of this Damascus cutting effect did not occur with these early knives. However, there are a couple of ways you can still make hard and soft layers in Damascus. One is to use steel plus pure nickel, because the carbon doesn't diffuse into the nickel, and even if it did, the nickel still wouldn't harden like the steel does. So you get hard steel and relatively soft nickel, and you can get them crossing at the edge, depending on the, layer, uh, the layering and the patterning. Another way to do it is to use two steels with different hardenability levels. So hardenability is how slow you can cool steel from high temperature and it's still harden. So a water hardening steel has low hardenability. You have to quench it in water or have a thin cross section in fast oil for it to harden. A high hardenability steel is air hardening. So you heat it up hot and you can just leave it in air and it will harden. So if you combine a water hardening steel and an air hardening steel and then cool it in air, the air hardening steel hardens, the water hardening steel does not, and then you get hard and soft layers. So it is possible to create the hard and soft layers which may lead to the Damascus cutting effect, uh, but we wanna test, does it actually happen if you do have hard and soft layers? And would it be beneficial if you did have hard and soft layers? Would you get some kind of serration effect in a slicing cutting test? 
So one of the tests that we did was with 1095 and pure nickel so that we can look at this Damascus cutting effect. We also looked at a whole range of different combinations, you know, popular ones like 1084 and 15 and 20. That's probably the most common uh, combination, especially in the last 20 years or so. And uh, O1 and L6. And then we looked at some so-called uh, high performance combinations like Crew Forge V with 15 and 20 or Apex Ultra and L6 to see if double high carbon combinations give us better edge retention. So we're gonna look at those as well as the toughness of these different combinations. First with the low alloy steels because they're more common. Then we'll move into the high alloy and stainless stuff. Uh, we looked at so many things, but let's, let's just start here. So another important aspect of Damascus is the patterning itself. For example, when you give the steel a ladder pattern, the layers uh, go in a wave along where the edge will be. So when you have a thin edge, you get crisscrossing of the layers across that edge, as opposed to a random pattern where they are straight layers. When we did Catra slicing edge retention testing, we saw consistently that the ladder pattern outcut the straight layer random pattern. So for example, here we have Apex Ultra, which is a high carbon steel with vanadium and tungsten additions for edge retention, along with L6, a 0.7% nickel steel for contrast. It does get hard, but its wear resistance is significantly lower than the Apex Ultra. So I have that compared with 8670, which is a similar steel to L6. So it gets lower edge retention. It's at a little bit lower hardness and it has less wear resistance than Apex Ultra, so it tests lower. But when we combine the two steels, Apex Ultra and L6, in a straight random pattern, we get a test which is roughly in between Apex Ultra and 8670 or an L6. That makes sense. We've got a 50-50 combination. We get something roughly in the middle between the two steels. However, when we did a ladder pattern, when we got crisscrossing along the edge, then it cut almost to the level of the straight Apex Ultra. So this was a little bit of a surprise. We thought the ladder pattern might help, but even introducing a lower wear resistance steel, it cuts similarly to the higher wear resistance of the two steels, in this case, the Apex Ultra. Now let's look at the other low alloy steels that we tested. So again, you can see that 1.2419 and 15 and 20 cut very well. 1.2419 is another high carbon tungsten alloyed steel like Apex Ultra is. Uh, Crew Forge V is a vanadium alloyed steel and when it was used with 15 and 20, it did well. Uh, O1 and L6, even though it was in a random pattern, it did pretty good in this test in part due to its high hardness. It actually did similarly to Apex Ultra and L6 in a random pattern. Uh, oh, I should also note that the Crew Forge V15 and 20, it performed about the same as straight Crew Forge V. So again, the latter patterning seems to have helped with its performance. 1084 and 15 and 20 did okay. You know, again, those are relatively low wear resistant steels at 60 Rockwell in a random pattern. So it did not do anything uh, surprisingly awesome. It did how we expect it to do. And 01 L6 Bainite, it was lower in hardness, and so it's at the bottom of this chart. Looking at the microstructures of some of those steels, you can see what gives the steels higher edge retention and higher wear resistance. So for example, a steel like Crew Forge V, it has a significant vanadium addition, and so there are hard vanadium carbides in the microstructure. You know, here is a relatively large vanadium carbide. Those hard carbides resist wear, and therefore it cuts longer in a slicing edge retention test. And if we look at a low, lower carbon combination like 1084 and 15 and 20, you know, they are much lower in carbide. There are not as many clearly evident carbides because they are close to the eutectoid composition, meaning there's not extra carbide after you heat them up before quenching them. And so that steel has lower edge retention. And there are steels in the middle like O1 and L6 where there's some carbide in there, in the O1 especially. And 1.2419, there are fine uh, iron and tungsten carbides throughout the structure. 
and that gives it higher wear resistance and therefore higher slicing edge retention. However, there is one low alloy combination that did better than all of the others, and that was 1095 with nickel. So yes, we did it. We proved that there is a Damascus cutting effect. The one thing that I never thought I would say, the Damascus cutting effect is a real thing. In a slicing edge retention test, in this case the Catra, the 1095 and nickel outperformed Apex Ultra and L6, it outperformed Crew Forge V and 15 and 20, it outperformed all of the other steels. Now you can see that the composite hardness reading here is only about 51. That is misleading because the soft nickel reduces the measurement in the Rockwell hardness test. However, when I used a 60 Rockwell testing file, it skated on the 1095, meaning the 1095 is harder. I estimate it to be around 61, 62 Rockwell 1095. But we indeed showed, at least in a ladder pattern, that 1095 and nickel showed greatly improved edge retention over straight 1095. So I looked at the worn edge after the test and you can see black lines from the nickel wearing in the edge during the test. So there's about 8% nickel. So there's not a huge amount of nickel, but enough to make a difference. And when you zoom in even further with high magnification, you can see the worn layers of nickel. And then at the very edge, a little worn spot, you know, leading to potentially this serration effect. So we confirmed the Damascus cutting effect. I didn't think that was going to be found in this study, but we found that. Looking at the microstructure, it looks like normal 1095 along with nickel. The nickel resists etching, so you get nice bright layers from the nickel. Then these dark 1095 with small iron carbides throughout. So some quick definitions about what Damascus we're looking at. We're looking at pattern welded Damascus, meaning two different materials, two or more different materials laminated together. And we frequently get the question by people, what's better Damascus or the new super steels? This question doesn't really make sense because you can theoretically forge weld any materials together. So if you use two super steels together, then what are we even asking? Are two super steels better than one super steel? I guess just the question doesn't make sense. The performance of the Damascus is going to be controlled by a variety of factors, such as which materials did you forge weld together? Uh, are they forge welded properly? Or are there welding flaws or impurities between the layers? What is the layer count? How thick are the layers? In what orientation are the layers? When we pattern it, it changes the shape and orientation of the layers, which can impact our performance depending on the direction that we are testing. So all these different things can affect Damascus. And again, this question of super steels versus Damascus, that question makes no sense. And in this study, we will test a couple of super steel combinations of Damascus. Another thing I did recently was publish a brand new book, The Story of Knife Steel, Innovators Behind Modern Damascus and Super Steels. And this book was an exploration of the history of knife steel itself. The metallurgists, the knife makers, the knife companies that introduced different steels, that looked at different heat treating techniques, that pushed the boundaries in different areas. And the book is not just a series of dates or just pictures, though there are many, many pictures, color pictures in the book. Uh, but I tried to get as many first-hand accounts as I could from knife makers and metallurgists. So you hear the story from their own lips, you hear why they did things, how they got to different conclusions, and it was just a really fun book to work on. I spent probably a thousand hours on the book, about 18 months of active work on it. And one of the fun things is reading what were people saying about knives and steel at different times. Okay, let's transition to toughness. One really important aspect of toughness is the direction that you test in. The main reason for this is because steel is hot rolled at the steel mill, and therefore it has elongated features along the rolling direction. Two big ones are manganese sulfides, which are impurities in the steel. So the steel companies try to minimize the sulfur content in the steel and they get it as low as they can. And then to help with the rest of the sulfur, they add manganese. 
is iron sulfides are really bad, but manganese sulfides are ductile at high rolling temperatures and therefore they elongate and they make the steel somewhat less tough when you have a crack growing along that direction. Another issue with tool steels is that we have lots of carbide in the steel and carbides will also elongate along the rolling direction. So both of these factors, carbide structure, other microstructure features and impurities are all elongated along the rolling direction and therefore when cracks grow in that direction, toughness is lower. So here is a schematic showing our rolling direction and this is what's called a transverse toughness specimen and it breaks along the rolling direction. And so the cracks can form along those sulfides or carbide stringers or other microstructure features and therefore toughness is reduced. However, if we do a longitudinal specimen, the crack grows perpendicular to the rolling direction and therefore the toughness is higher than a transverse specimen. Now with Damascus, this is largely unaffected, at least in the type of laminate that we're discussing here. Uh, another type of toughness we could discuss is bending, where we might get fractures that grow through the different layers. But when we talk about a knife edge, we are getting an impact sort of to the side, where it matters if we're in the rolling direction or transverse direction. So if we have a knife blade that's along the rolling direction, like this one on the right, and then we are chopping, for example, it is similar to a longitudinal toughness test. And this is the orientation that I recommend in my book, Knife Engineering. However, some knife makers will put knife blades in the alternate orientation, perpendicular to the rolling direction. And then when we're chopping, then the cracks will grow in along the rolling direction, which reduces our toughness. Several years ago, my father and I did a study on the toughness of Crew Forge V, and we measured in both orientations, longitudinal and transverse. And as expected, the transverse toughness was significantly lower than the longitudinal toughness, and this was consistent across hardness, though the two values get closer together at higher hardness. There's a bigger spread in the 61 and a half Rockwell specimens than in the 66 and a half Rockwell specimens. However, when we tested the Crew Forge V15 and 20 Damascus in both orientations, we found that the longitudinal and transverse toughness was very similar. And this is a pattern that we saw with the rest of our materials. And what I think is happening is that we have an effect of the patterning. So this steel was made by Salem Straub with a W's ladder pattern. And the ladder pattern creates these lines that go across the rolling direction so that cracks can grow through them. However, I did not expect this factor to be important because if you look at the cross section, it's not like there are straight lines that go through everywhere. There are more wavy lines, but apparently this is enough to reduce our toughness and consistently we saw with ladder patterned steel that the longitudinal and transverse toughness was very similar. So the ladder patterning led to better edge retention but worse longitudinal toughness. Well, another test we did was with the Apex Ultra L6 Damascus where we tested both ladder pattern and random straight layer Damascus in both orientations. In this test, we saw that the random pattern steel had better toughness than the ladder pattern uh, in both orientations. So the, the random pattern was better. Ladder patterning led to a reduction in toughness, especially in longitudinal toughness. However, we were very surprised at these toughness results because the Apex Ultra Damascus was significantly lower in toughness than Apex Ultra itself, and especially so when compared with L6 Damascus. So what is going on? Well, we, we looked at the microstructure and we found that the Damascus had a lot of grain boundary carbide. Now grain boundary carbide is an issue in high carbon, low alloy steels. 
is the higher in carbon you are, the more that the carbide wants to form on grain boundaries. And my father had forged at low temperature, uh, similar to the normalizing temperature, and thought that this would eliminate the grain boundary carbide, but that didn't happen. So after we saw this low toughness and saw that the issue was grain boundary carbide, we took the same steel and we normalized it at high temperature and plate quenched to ensure no grain boundary carbide formed. Then we did a grain refinement from 1450 and annealed from 1450 and then retested. This time we looked at two patterns, one in ladder pattern and another in a pattern called snakeskin. So this was to test if patterning itself is having some effect on the toughness or if we have a different type of pattern if toughness improves. So unlike ladder pattern where there are lines that are perpendicular to the rolling direction, snakeskin is not. It's in the opposite orientation and they're rounder features. When we tested snakeskin, the toughness was slightly better than Apex Ultra on its own. So some benefit of the L6 and the ladder pattern was reduced versus straight Apex Ultra. So ladder patterning improves edge retention, but it is worse for longitudinal toughness. Now, another thing to note is that the toughness, even of the snake skin, is very similar to Apex Ultra alone, even though it has that tougher L6 in the mix. And this is another thing that you will see with our other combinations tested, that the toughness is mostly controlled by the less tough of the two steels. So this is like a fracture begins at the weakest link scenario. So when you've got a tough steel and a less tough steel, that tough steel isn't doing that much for the overall toughness, at least in this type of toughness test. And this fact was confirmed with an even more extreme case, which was 1095 and nickel. So nickel is a soft, very ductile, high toughness material in combination with the 1095. But this 1095 nickel combination tested similarly to 62 Rockwell 1095 on its own. The nickel did not really benefit it for toughness. Uh, we also had both 01 L6 in martensite and in bainite as expected. The bainite did better. Uh, because this was a random straight layer Damascus, the 01 L6 was, its toughness was relatively good. Again, you can see on this chart the difference between ladder pattern and snakeskin on the Apex Ultra L6. Uh, we already discussed the Crew Forge V15 and 20. The 1.2419 and 20 Damascus was also not very high, in part because of its ladder patterning. Uh, the best steel that we tested in the low alloy category was the 1084, 15, and 20. So both of these are high toughness steels, though the 15 and 20 is tougher because of its nickel content, but 1084 is no slouch either. So it tested similarly to 1084, uh, more similar to 1084 than the higher toughness 15 and 20, but also it was in random pattern, which helped its toughness versus the latter patterned conditions. Another thing to note is that 1084 and 15 and 20 was the only broken specimen where there were visible welding flaws or at least delaminations. And this did, was not detrimental to the toughness, somewhat surprisingly. Uh, these welding flaws were also visible in the microstructure of the steel. There were some of these black lines in between the 1084 and 15 and 20 layers. So again, they were visible in the fractured specimens and in the microstructure, but they did not negatively affect the toughness in this test. So I should also talk about the people who made the Damascus that we tested. Uh, the 1084, 15, and 20 came from Gambler Custom, made by Peyton Pelland. The 01L6 was from Casey Lund with samples that were machined by Will Brigham, another Damascus maker. Uh, the Crew Forge V15 and 20 was made by Salem Straub. Uh, my father, Devin Thomas, made the Apex Ultra L6 and the 1095 Pure Nickel and the 1.2419 15 and 20. High alloy steels that we're about to get to, I got some Dama Steel, which is made with RWL34 and PMC27. Uh, I also got some S90V20CV from Seth Burton of Cosmo Knives. 
And then the rest of the high alloy stainless combinations came from Devon Thomas. So those included 3V154CM, 19C27 with 302, 19C27 with 716, AEBL with 716, and AEBL with 154CM. Now, uh, Damascus studies are very expensive because the steel is very labor intensive. So I bought steel from most of these knife makers and I also paid my father to make a bunch of the specific steel combinations for study. You know, he can't just take two, three, four weeks uh, from working to make a bunch of steel for fun science studies. He has to make a living as well. So between all of that purchase deal and paying my dad, uh, this is one of the most expensive tests that I've ever done for knife steel nerds. So, you know, Damascus is expensive material. This study was around 10 grand. And I bring this up to say that if you like this type of work, you should support us on Patreon. So I use the Patreon to fund these types of studies. There's no way I could get away with spending 10 grand on a fun knife steel study just because I want to. Uh, that's just too much money. And that's what Patreon lets us do. I've been doing Patreon for a couple of years now. Originally, I had no plans on getting any money for knife steel nerds. But when I started to think about what would be possible with some money, I set up the Patreon for that and I just spend that money like it's free. So I've spent a surprising amount of money uh, on the experiments that have been done for this website and the YouTube channel. And uh, it's been amazing. We've done, you know, this is the biggest Damascus performance study ever performed. And it's all because of Patreon. So if you're interested, please go on patreon.com slash nerds and that funds this type of research. The biggest of the studies that I did with my father for this set of experiments was on whether or not we can improve the microstructure of steel through high layer count Damascus. So we chose AEBL and 154CM in a 50-50 ratio. AEBL has a really fine microstructure due to its design and processing by Udahom. So its microstructure is finer than most powder metallurgy steels, just through sheer metallurgy. But 154CM has relatively coarse carbides like other non-powder metallurgy steels. There are powder metallurgy versions available, including CPM-154 and RWL-34. But for this study, we wanted to see, can we decrease the size of the carbides through forging? So for example, if you've got a steel with a really high layer count, we can get the layers thinner than like one micron, which is significantly smaller than these carbides in the normal conventionally available steel. So can we forge down the steel to the point where these carbides are submicron through a high layer count? That is the question we wanted to answer. So we did a series of different layer counts. So we had 25 layers, 125 layers, 625 layers, 3,125 layers. And we had that, it, uh, most of them were in ladder pattern, but we had one condition where the 3,000 layer was forged down further so it remained unpatterned, so random straight layers rather than the latter pattern like the others. So if we look at the microstructure in the 25 layer steel, the microstructures of the two steels look basically the same. So we have regular 154 CM with relatively large carbides and we have AEBL with its fine carbides. At 125 layers, the d distinction between the two layers is not as sharp in 25 layers, but they're still pretty consistent. We've got 154 CM with larger carbides and AEBL with fine carbides. You can also see where some of the carbides are starting to uh, be across the boundary between the two steels. So it seems like those carbides, once the steel is homogenous, the carbides are able to go outside of that transition. Once we get to 625 layers, the layers are more difficult to see and the transitions are more diffuse. So earlier in this video, I talked about how carbon diffuses very rapidly and that it's not carbon that leads to differences between the two steels. The difference in etching behavior comes from other alloying elements. And when you combine AEBL and 154CM, 
The reason why they have contrast after etching is primarily because 154CM has 4% moly, while AABL has none. However, as we get to higher and higher layer counts, those layers get thinner and thinner. They spent more time at high temperature, there's more diffusion. And so we're getting more diffusion of molybdenum between the two steels. And so we get these more diffuse transitions between the two steels. And also the carbides are getting smaller, but we're also seeing them cross the transition boundaries between the two steels. At 3,125 layers, we can no longer see the layers. So we can't see them really at all. And uh, we can tell for sure that the carbides are not smaller than our estimated two micron layer thickness. However, the carbides are smaller than in the original 154 cm steel. And if we look at the unpatterned 3000 layer count, again, the microstructure looks pretty similar. So without a full statistical analysis, we can't really tell how much smaller the carbides got. However, we can look at did our toughness improve by going down to thinner and thinner layers. So we tested in both longitudinal and transverse directions. And when they were ladder patterned, the longitudinal transverse toughness was almost identical. However, the toughness did improve as we went to smaller layers, thinner layers at a higher layer count. When we tested the unpatterned steel, which had approximately one micron thick layers, if the layers are even still a thing, there was a gap again between the longitudinal and transverse toughness uh, to about the extent that we would expect. Again, the toughness was closer to 154 cm than it was to AEBL. But in this case, we did see a benefit to having the two materials together, especially in a high layer count. So the lower layer count material was closest to 154 cm. As we got up to a high layer count, it was a little more in between the two steels. However, the problem with having a high layer count is that you know you can no longer see layers. So what is the point of Damascus if there's no longer a pattern? So we did get an improvement in properties, but at the cost of a beautiful pattern. One thing I noticed when analyzing the fractured specimens, especially in the low layer count ladder patterned material, is it did look like the crack was growing through individual layers. So you can see that we had a crack growing through this layer, and then the crack moved over to another layer and traveled up it, and then it moved to another layer and then traveled up uh, that one. So this seems to confirm that the ladder patterning is leading to worse toughness because it has these preferential places where the crack can grow in an orientation consistent with the pattern. So that seems to be what ladder patterning is doing. We also measured edge retention of the AEBL 154CM, and we found no effect of layer count. So in this case, no effect on edge retention, though a sizable effect on toughness. Uh, so this makes some sense, and it's still a little bit surprising. And because it was in ladder pattern, the edge retention was much closer to 154 cm than it was to AEBL. However, this was actually surprising because the very first CATRA study that my father and I ever did was on AEBL 154 cm Damascus. And in that case, we found the Damascus to be right in between straight AEBL and 154 cm steels. And in that study, we had three knives an AEBL knife, a 154CM knife, and then a 50-50 ladder pattern mix. And so we found catra edge retention right in between the two, and we're like, okay, that makes sense. Uh, but we were using a catra tester at Spyderco. Uh, they were very generous in letting us use that. Uh, we brought unsharpened knives and let Spyderco sharpen them because we thought that they would have a, a specialized method for it though they really did not at the time. At that time, they were just sharpening on a belt grinder. And this may have been a case where just the sharpening uh, of the ABL 154CM Damascus was not as good as the straight 154CM and made this satisfying uh, split between the two steels. But in our new testing, it really seems like in a ladder pattern, 
that the edge retention is closer to the higher wear resistance steel, in this case 154 cm. So I wanted to point out that some of our new results where the ladder pattern leads to edge retention closer to that higher wear resistance steel, it contradicts our earlier study. So we also tested a bunch of other high alloy steels in different combinations. So AEBL is a standard razor steel we already discussed, and 154CM, it's an old standby bearing stainless steel. 19C27 is a high carbon steel made by Sandvik, now called Alima. 716 is a 420 steel on the upper end of carbon. 302 is an austenitic stainless steel, very low in carbon, doesn't normally harden. RWL34 is a powder metallurgy version of 154CM and ATS34. PMC27 is a powder metallurgy version of 12C27. Uh, S90V and 20CV are very high carbon, high vanadium powder metallurgy steels, and 3V is a popular powder metallurgy high toughness non-stainless steel. So of course we also already talked about the AEBL 154CM Damascus. We also talked to, we're also going to talk about Damasteel. So Damasteel is a common stainless Damascus that's available made with two powder metallurgy steels, RWL34 and PMC27. I also tested some AEBL 716 and 19C27 716. This is similar to the composition that Alima is starting to offer, which is a 19C27 7C27MO2 steel. So 7C27MO2 is the same as 716. Uh, so my father had made some 19C27 716 in the past, and so we're able to compare with how a Lima steel is likely to perform, though I wasn't able to get any in time. We also looked at 19C27-302 and AEBL-302. I have an old test that I will also compare with. Then two of the highest wear resistance steels ever combined in Damascus, S90V and 20CV from Seth Burton. Then we also have 3V-154CM. So lots of high alloy steels that we're going to be able to compare. Okay, starting with the toughness. The AEBL 154CM, we can see how its toughness changed relative to other steels at different layer counts and the patterning. So the 3000 layer random pattern Damascus, it did almost as well as the Damasteel, somewhat surprisingly. Uh, in part because the Damasteel RWL34 still has significantly finer carbides than the 154CM big carbides that we had at 3000 layers. So that 3000 layer random did quite well. Uh, the S90V 20CV also did very well, so similar in toughness to those two steels individually. Our best steel was AEBL 716. So two high toughness stainless steels combined together, they had excellent toughness even in a ladder pattern. So the random pattern we would expect to do even a little bit better. However, one minor surprise is that the AEBL 302 did relatively low. This is the old test that I was talking about, one that had a, a big surprise early on. AEBL and 302 are both high toughness steels. So why did we get such low toughness? The 19C27 302 makes more sense because 19C27 has larger carbides in it. So its toughness is not as high. But the AEBL 302, these are both tough steel. So what happened? Well, when we looked at the microstructure, we found that the 302, where normally it has no carbide, was forming a significant amount of carbide and very large carbides. Earlier, we talked about diffusion between two steels. Because 302 has almost no carbon in it, there is a lot of carbon diffusion that comes from the AEBL into the 302. And so carbides are going to form. Though it's surprising how big the carbides are. It could be that we're getting some melting at the interface between the two steels. Because when you go higher in carbon, the melting temperature of steel goes down. This is why cast iron has really high carbon. So it melts at a lower temperature, hence why it's called cast iron. So they add a bunch of carbon to it, the melting temperature is lower. So when a lot of carbon is going into the 302, there is carbon that builds up at the interface between the two steels, and perhaps that is high enough where you get melting, and then when it re-solidifies, big carbides are forming. Though maybe there is some other mechanism in place. All I know is that looking at the steel, there are big carbides in the 302. Those big carbides act as places where cracks can nucleate, 
and then the toughness is low, similar to other large carbide stainless steels. We saw something similar in the 19C27-302 Damascus. So there are already large carbides in the 19C27, but then there are also big carbides in the 302 from carbon diffusion from the 19C27 into the 302. So the 19C27-302 Damascus had similar toughness to the 19C27-716, even though we might think that the 302 layers would help us for toughness, but really they didn't. The 3V154CM Damascus, again, its toughness is much closer to 154CM than it is to the high toughness 3V. So just like we've been discussing, the less tough of the two steels primarily controls the toughness behavior of the steel, and adding a tougher steel to it does not help that much. Looking at edge retention for these high alloy and stainless steels, as expected, the S90V20CV did excellent on the test. Uh, this is despite the fact that it was not ladder patterned. It had something that looks closer to snakeskin pattern, which also helped its toughness. But the edge retention was much higher than everything else due to those high carbon and lots of vanadium carbide in the steel. So just like we would expect, two high wear resistant steels equals a high edge retention steel in a slicing Catra test. The AEBL154CM and Dama steel did similar. Uh, a minor surprise is this 19C27716, uh, which did similarly to what we would expect 19C27 might do on its own, probably helped by the ladder patterning, and it actually did very similar to Damasteel, even though Damasteel has the higher carbon RWL34 in it. The 3V154CM did about where we would expect it to go, and the lowest was the AEBL716. So again, these are the the lowest carbon combination that we tested, so there's much less carbide in the AEBL716, and it did lower in edge retention than the other higher carbon steels, as we would expect. However, it did very similarly to how AEBL would do on its own, presumably because the ladder patterning boosted its edge retention back up to the level of AEBL despite the lower carbon 716. Another thing to note is that almost all of these steels did better than any of the low alloy steels because the chromium carbides in them are harder than iron carbide and that gives them better edge retention in the Catra test. So we'll also go through some of the micrographs of the high alloy steels to discuss why they behave the way they did. Uh, the 3V154CM Damascus, you can see the large chromium carbides in the 154CM and the relatively smaller carbides in the 3V. You can also see that there was significantly less 154CM than 3V in this particular Damascus, uh, which even though it was mostly 3V, the toughness still mostly reflected the coarser carbides in the 154CM. And the reason for that is that the toughness is often greatly limited by crack initiation. And so cracks initiate much easier in bigger carbides. Bigger carbides are just more brittle. They fracture under less stress. And so if a crack initiates, then it's going to grow pretty rapidly. You know, these are very high hardness materials, these knife steels. So crack growth is pretty rapid. So the 154CM really reduced the toughness of the 3V154CM combination. Uh, but if we look at AEBL716, these are both steels designed for a very fine microstructure, even though they're not powder metallurgy, and we see very fine carbides in both of the materials uh, that are in the Damascus. With 19C27 and 716, we see fine carbides in the 716, but we didn't have the issue of large carbides forming like we did in the 302 combinations. The fine carbides were still present in the 716, and the 19C27 had its typical microstructure with some bigger carbides present, which reduces toughness. With the S90V20CV Damascus, it was almost sort of hard to tell where one material would begin and the other would end. Uh, both are pretty high carbide steels made with powder metallurgy, so they've got a lot of medium small carbides from that powder metallurgy process. Both have a lot of chromium carbide and some vanadium carbide in it. Uh, but the overall microstructure is relatively fine. When we look at the Damasteel with RWL34 and PMC27, there were some more 
uh, diffuse transitions between the layers in this material, which I believe is because they layer up powder itself rather than solid steel made from the powder. So sometimes the layer transitions look a little bit different than the two solid materials that were used in other combinations we tested. Uh, but the main thing to note is that the carbides are very fine throughout and that the carbides in the RWL34 layers are in general finer than in our heavily forged 154CM Damascus. Here's another look at the broader microstructure. So this is lower magnification. You can see the micron bar is a full millimeter. And uh, another thing to note is that the way this damas steel is made, that the layers are straighter and more similar to straight random pattern at the edges of the bars. So as you get to the edge, it looks more and more like random pattern. And as you get to the center, then you get more of the wavy look. So the damas steel was somewhat unique in that it had a combination of straight layers at the edges and then the wavy layers at the center. So it would be fun if we could do some more tests specifically on this to see, you know, how does it affect things if we're in those straight layer regions or in the wavy layer regions. But that will have to wait for another time if I'm ready to spend several hundred dollars on more damas steel. So to summarize, we found some big things in this study. This is the largest study ever done on the performance of pattern welded Damascus, and we've got some big conclusions. The one is that we confirmed that the Damascus cutting effect is real, which again is something I never thought I would say. When we had hard 1095 and soft nickel, and we tested it in an edge retention test, we got a serration effect and higher slicing edge retention. Ladder patterning led to better slicing edge retention, but worse longitudinal toughness due to the orientation of the layers. When we tested toughness, it was largely controlled by the less tough of the two steels, and adding a more tough steel really didn't help. So the weakest link is what would lead to fracture initiation, and then those cracks would grow through the steel. There, so there's no free lunch even when it comes to Damascus patterning. You know, you can manipulate performance through patterning, but when you improve one thing, you'll reduce another. Uh, using low carbon 302 led to reduced toughness. So there wasn't really a benefit from those soft layers for toughness. In fact, it was detrimental. So AEBL and 302 are both two tough steels. And when we combine the two of them, we got a not tough steel. So sometimes there are steel combinations which are not really good for toughness, at least. Uh, we saw some delamination or welding flaws in the 1084, 15, and 20, but that did not affect the performance of the steel, which is a little bit surprising. Uh, we also did that big high layer Damascus count study with AEBL and 154CM. So we did reduce the carbide size of the 154CM and the toughness did get better but the carbides were not smaller than the layer thickness because eventually once you have a homogeneous material that's forge welded, those carbides can go outside of the layer transition and a one micron layer thickness does not mean sub one micron carbides. Uh, but by changing the layer count, we did not see any change in edge retention. So there was a performance benefit. We got higher toughness by greater reduction, higher layer count and no change in edge retention. So there was an improvement, but you also lose all of your pattern by doing that. Uh, higher wear resistant steels in Damascus, like using Apex Ultra in low alloy Damascus or S90V and 20CV in stainless Damascus led to greater slicing edge retention. This is totally expected. Uh, when you use higher wear resistance steels, the knife cuts longer. So that is all anticipated, I suppose. Though with how many surprises we found, who knows? But so that made perfect sense in our testing. So one more time, I would like to bring up my book again, The Story of Knife Steel. I spent so much time on that book, more time than anything I've ever worked on for my website or this YouTube channel. And I really want people to read it. I'm very proud of it. Some amazing stories in there from great knife makers and metallurgists. So read their words. I think you will be surprised by how they came to the conclusions that they did, how they tested certain things, why they had this idea or that one. Uh, there's so much to learn in here. Uh, you know, you can really learn the history of how the knife industry itself formed. You know, how did we get to here? 
How did custom knives develop? How did the production knife companies get better? How did things evolve in China? That's all in the book. So even if you just want to learn about the knife industry in general and don't care about steel, I think this book is great. I also want to mention the Patreon again, patreon.com slash nerds. Again, this is the biggest study ever done on Damascus, one of the most expensive I've ever done. I would not be able to do these types of tests without support from Patreon. So thank you, my Patreon supporters. So we do some fun stuff on there, extra discussions, some exclusive content. I report early tests of things. Like for example, I tested early, I showed early tests of MagnaCut on my Patreon before anybody else saw those tests. So that's an example of exclusive things you get as a Patreon supporter. So please come join us on Patreon. And hopefully we do more fun tests. So everybody, thanks for watching. I hope you learned something.